guys, welcome back. So today I wanna to do a quick video and show you one of the more unique pistols I have in my collection. This is a World War II Japanese Nambu pistol, which is chambered in eight millimeter. It's a very interesting little piece. Um, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about them. Uh, this is a Type 14. There's another one that's a Type 94. People get them confused. They'll say that these Type 14s are unsafe to shoot, and that's not really true. The Type 94s, which is a later design, uh, can be very dangerous to shoot because they have external trigger bars and things like that that make them very unsafe. But the Type 14 is, even in its late war production versions, where they were skimping on, on the quality controls, the guns are still quite capable shooters. The 8mm cartridge is a bottleneck cartridge. I'll show you what that looks like here in a few minutes. And this pistol was designed around 1925, but the Nambu goes back to the turn of the century. The Grandpa Nambu, which was designed around the turn of the century, around 1900 to 1902, um, went through a number of design changes, the Model A, B, and then we wound up with the Type 14. And until the Type 14 came about, the Japanese Imperial, Imperial military did not adopt a, a pistol, or did not adopt the Nambu pistol, I should say, uh, until then, around 1925, and they went into production, I think, around 1927. So this would have been the pistol that, that went to World War II. Now this version is a later production version, and you can tell that by a couple of things. First of all, the larger trigger guard here, you'll see other versions of this pistol that have a very small trigger guard, just almost a perfectly round trigger guard. And in Manchuria, the Japanese troops are complaining they could not get a gloved hand uh, onto the pistol with a, a gloved finger into the trigger guard without accidentally discharging the pistol. So they enlarged this in later versions of the gun. But you can also see here on the frame there's a 15.7, and that's the date that the handgun was manufactured, the 15th year of the rule of the emperor and uh, the seventh month. So it would be around July 1940, I believe, is what that date code puts this pistol at being manufactured in. So, um, yeah, it's a very, very cool little pistol. Now, again, a lot of folks would say that perhaps this was copied from the German Luger because it looks very similar. The barrel looks very similar, has a similar grip angle, but there's no evidence to support that. Uh, actually, the Japanese toured manufacturing facilities in Europe um, very early in the 1900s, and they probably were exposed to C96 broom handles, and that may have influenced the design of this pistol, which is a delayed uh, blowback pistol. I'll show you the other side of it here. Now this is your safety lever. It ejects on the top, just like a Luger. Has fixed sights in the rear and the front. Front sight looks very much like a Luger as well. So I can understand how folks might think that it was copied from the Luger. It has a magazine release right here. Let's see if you can see that. And again, it has a very light trigger pull. You can release the magazine by pushing the button and pulling the magazine out. And even the magazine looks very similar to a Luger magazine. This knurled knob here on the rear is how you would charge the pistol. So you'd put a full eight round magazine into the gun, pull rearward. Oops, actually if the safety's on, I'll show you that. If the safety's on, you cannot operate the trigger nor pull the charging handle. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip the safety off to the fire position, which is forward. Okay, now I can pull the bolt to the rear and you can see how it charges it will lock open on the last round fired. All right, very, very cool little pistol. Now you can find these online. Uh, they are collectibles. Ammunition is very hard to find, the eight millimeter Nambu. Um, you know, you're gonna pay probably around a buck around even if you can find it for sale. I'm lucky to have a few boxes of it, which I'm gonna shoot this afternoon. And the guns aren't known for their reliability either. Uh, I don't know if the, when they were manufactured at first, if they were, my gosh, I'm getting eaten up by mosquitoes today. I don't know if they were reliable when they first rolled off the assembly line and they just became progressively less reliable over time. I have updated this handgun with Wolf Springs. Wolf does manufacture a, uh, a spring kit for this gun. They also manufacture springs that are extra power springs. I've just installed the factory springs back into the pistol, keeping the originals, of course. But um, even then, the guns are still not very reliable. I would say a lot of that probably comes from this magazine. The magazine, much like the Luger, keeps the rounds at a very steep angle in the magazine. If you put them horizontal, 
the magazine isn't long enough to even accept the, the round, so the rounds have to be kept at a very steep angle, which causes the rim to drag on the back side of the magazine and the nose of the bullet to drag on the front side, increasing friction. And when this thing does malfunction, typically it's the bolt overriding around in the magazine. So in essence, that will tell you that basically the magazine spring is not able to keep up with the velocity of the bolt. So uh, it's also worth noting, now the weapon is clear, that you can see how the delay mechanism works. I'm gonna go ahead and push on the muzzle of the pistol and you can see how it goes back. Now inside here, there's a little, oh, it's kind of an L-shaped locking bracket that swings up and locks on the bottom of the bolt. And when you push it back under recoil, that distance starts to swing that little locking lever down and out of the way. So then it frees the bolt up to come to the rear. And now you can see how it locked open on the last round fired. Disassembling this handgun is not easy. Uh, they call it field stripping, but quite honestly, because I'm out in the field today with it, I'm not going to disassemble it. It has a number of very small springs. Also, when you're reassembling it, it's very easy to cause one of those little springs to go sailing, and I really don't want to lose any springs today. So I'm not going to take it apart. There are a number of good disassembly videos out there. Matter of fact, I'll link to one in the description below. The firearms blog uh, has a great video showing you how to fully disassemble the Type 14 Nambu pistol. Also, I, I want to update something that I had said previously in my Luger video. I said that Bill Ruger drew inspiration from the Luger, and that may very well be true, but that's not the, the story. The story is actually that a, a returning Marine from World War II in um, 1945 had either given or sold Bill Ruger a Nambu, and, and Bill Ruger actually copied these in his garage, but he decided not to go to market with them, but instead he took a lot of the design nuances in terms of overall appearance barrel, how it charges, and incorporated it into his popular Mark II pistol. So I wanted to correct what I had said previously in my Luger video. I get these guns confused sometimes. I have so many. Good problem to have, right? All right, guys, I'm going to step over to the firing line, load it up, and do a little bit of shooting with the pistol. Now, again, I'm going to tell you right up front, expect a number of malfunctions. I don't know anybody that has one of these that uh, can fire 100 rounds without multiple malfunctions. Uh, typically, you're going to see multiple malfunctions per magazine. And again, I think that may be due to design problems in the, in the magazine itself. Uh, it can't be due to worn springs because I've updated all the springs in the gun. So how this thing passed military trials, I'll never know. All right, let's head over to the firing line, do a little bit of shooting. Loading the Nambu is just like loading a Luger or even a Ruger Mark II pistol. You have a little follower with the tab on the outside of the magazine here that you can pull down and compress the spring in the magazine. So what you'll do is you'll take your 8mm Nambu cartridges, which is one right here, and you'll drop those into the magazine like that. Now you'll notice that they keep that nose really, really high up in the magazine. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's not all that reliable in the feeding department. Now they can typically hold eight rounds, but um, I'm only gonna load five because we're gonna probably have to clear three or four malfunctions here. There's three, four, and five. Now, as I mentioned, the ammunition is very hard to come by. Not many people shoot this ammunition for obvious reasons. The guns are rather obscure. It's an oddball cartridge. It's not exactly a reliable gun. And outside of war production in Japan, these things weren't produced. So, um, yeah. To load it, rounds forward in the pistol grip, just like you would load any other gun. It'll lock into place. The magazine release is right here and it's recessed into the wood, so unloading it is a little bit challenging. You actually have to break your grip and rotate your thumb around to release the magazine. Also, mine's screwing up. When I release the magazine, the bolt goes home. I don't believe it's supposed to do that. So, I'm gonna go ahead and charge the pistol. Once you have the, the magazine fully inserted, all you have to do is make sure that it's on fire, which is with the safety lever forward. Make sure it's on fire, grab the charging handle, pull it to the rear and just let it go sharply, and then you'll notice it ejects straight upwards. Now again, I'm probably gonna to have to clear a few malfunctions here. Okay. You can see that malfunction, that was a failure to eject. So these reloads may be a little bit soft as well. And I got a nice little double feed going on there. Okay, I lost one round there.
and it's empty already. All right, so you saw it lock open there. I'm gonna go ahead, now watch what happens when I pull my magazine out. And I've taken it apart, and I can't figure out what in the world's causing this. Somebody out there knows, please post down below, I hope I see it. Now, when I release the magazine, I typically have to go out like this, because you can see that that magazine release is flush in the wood grip. I have to push it in and pull it out, and when I do, that bolt drops, goes home. Okay, now you want to be very careful in handling these and make sure that the muzzle's always pointed in a safe direction. As the guys over at the firearms blog found out, um, they can be a little bit finicky and temperamental, and they actually had one go off when the trigger wasn't even being touched. They were clearing a malfunction. So you do want to be very, very careful with these guns. Um, they're not, uh, not exactly the safest things in the world. They won't blow up when you shoot them, but um, they can have discharges when you're not expecting it. Uh, they don't have any type of safety mechanism on the striker, and they are striker fired. There's three, four, actually four. I'll stick one more in there for a fifth one. Five. Now look at that magazine. See how those rounds are sticking in there? They're laying in the magazine at a very, very sharp angle. You can see them through the window there, the little slit. And it's also interesting to note... Again, if I take this top round out and hold it next to the magazine, you can see it's actually longer than the magazine. So it has to keep it at that really sharp angle so that uh, it can fit in the magazine and feed, which again is very similar to the Luger, and I'll have similar malfunctions with the Luger. All right, go ahead and make the pistol ready. And let's see how she does this time. Five more rounds. Now again, it has a very, very light trigger pull. Look at that, got all five rounds out of it without a malfunction, and it did lock open. Recoil is really minimal on these things. It's, it's not a very hot load whatsoever. Now look at that, there's a spent case here. It didn't kick out that, that spent case, it was just laying on the magazine inside there. All right, so I'm gonna load it up one more time here. Sadly, now watch me pull the magazine out. Bolt goes home. Smoke coming out of the pistol grip there. Go ahead and watch that muzzle. Sticking it in a cargo pocket while I reload. Now you also wanna be very careful with these handguns because they're notorious for breaking their firing pins. So you don't wanna dry fire the gun. It's not a good idea. Uh, if you break the firing pin, you're kind of in trouble. I don't have a holster for it, but I'm told that the holsters that they were issued with uh, actually contained a spare firing pin within the holster itself because even the Japanese knew that they were prone to failure. And one way you can avoid breaking that, obviously, again, is not dry firing the pistol. Seems like every round I put in there, see, look what it's doing. You can, I don't know if you can see that, but that bottom round is not being held correctly. It's almost straight up and down inside the magazine. I'm telling you guys, the reliability issues with this gun are going to be related to the magazine. I'm almost certain of it here. All right, I think I got it straightened out there. Four, let's we'll go with five again here. I push our luck. All right, little guy. Here we go. And there, it just failed to push the round out of the magazine. I'm telling you, it's probably the spring. Let's see if we can get it to feed it. No, isn't gonna go. Oh, now I'm crushing the bullet into the case, dang it. And there's no way to manually lock the bolt back, so I'm gonna have to pull the magazine out. Hope that it, it may have actually tried to chamber that round. It's pinched the round inside there. It just fell out. All right, I'm not gonna be able to shoot that one because it crushed it back into the case. I only have one round left. And it's not gonna let me put it in. We'll fire this one round out. And it's not firing. You know what, guys? It may have broken the firing pin. 
doesn't look like it. And that's how an accidental discharge happens. Bolt just went home, there's one in the chamber. Let's see, oh, you know what happened? So this is what happened. This is actually started to unscrew itself. To disassemble it, you push this little plunger in and unscrew this knob. Somehow under recoil, even though it has a brand new spring in it, it overcame that spring and this knob started to unscrew itself and that's what caused that failure. I just noticed that. All right, let's see now if uh, it'll fire this last round. It's not allowing me to shoot. Where's my magazine? I'll stick it in there. Here we go. All right. There you go, guys. Not something I would consider to be a reliable pistol by any means. Now, you guys are probably wondering if you can reload for it since the ammunition is so hard to come by. Yes, but it, it, getting the brass is where the challenge is. But the brass can be formed from either 40 Smith & Wesson cases or even 357 SIG cases. So if you want to reload for it and dies are available, you can actually reload for it. There's actually um, a Nambu Shooters Association out there where these guys get together and shoot these old guns. And they are pretty cool. Three, four, five. And uh, they're probably loading their own ammo because it's very, very hard to find. And again, you're gonna pay over a buck around for it. When I've seen the cases, the preformed cases for sale, those are 70 cents a round. That's before you put a primer, powder, and a bullet in it. All right, let's fire another five rounds here. See if we can get full five. There we go. So, <laughs> and once again, it didn't throw that last case completely free. It was, uh, it was laying in there on the follower of the magazine. Well, that's a very, very interesting pistol and a lot of fun to shoot. The 8mm Nambu is not what I would consider a powerful cartridge. In its military loadings, it was offered with a 102 grain bullet moving around 950 feet per second. That gives it about 200 foot-pounds of energy, which makes it about as powerful as a 380 ACP. So it's not a very hot load, and by uh, comparison, it's something of a PUD load compared to 9mm and 45 ACP, which were the other handgun calibers in common use during the Second World War. But it does make for a very mild shooting pistol. If you're going to shoot this, you're going to have to get used to clearing malfunctions. Dang it. I think I just ruined another round. There goes a dollar wasted. You can see how it's starting to push that bullet back in the case. Seems to be at the exact same point in the magazine on the third round. Got two rounds left. So, yeah, it's a very, uh, got to pull that magazine out and the bolt drops. But, uh, yeah, it's an interesting little caliber to shoot. I wouldn't recommend racing out to buy one of these guys. It's definitely a collector's item. It's uh, not something I shoot very often. Matter of fact, this is uh, only the second time I've ever shot this gun and I'll probably not shoot it again for another decade. I just wanted to bring it out. I saw it sitting on the wall and wanted to show it to you guys. One, two, three, four, five. All right, let's see if we can get five rounds out of this thing without a malfunction. Or breaking a firing pin. I want to say it malfunctioned, but it didn't. That time it did. All right. You can see it almost got that round up in there. I thought it malfunctioned a second ago because the trigger wasn't pulling. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So you guys get the idea. If I was a Japanese officer, which they were required to purchase these, and uh, they were issued to um, non-commissioned officers, but the officers, per European tradition, were actually required to buy their own pistols. And if I was a Japanese officer and I was forced to buy one of these, I think I'd just leave it in the holster. Um, yeah, don't think I'd ever want to have to use this in a fight. 
But um, yeah, very, very interesting little piece of history for sure. I hope you guys enjoyed coming out and taking a look at my Type 14 Nambu pistol from World War II. Again, this one was manufactured in July of 1940, so there's a good chance this pistol may have actually been used in the war. They're interesting collector's pieces. I wouldn't recommend racing out to buy one if you want to shoot at a whole bunch. Ammunition's hard to find, although it can be reloaded for, as I would mentioned previously. But, you know, it's more or less just a conversation piece and a very cool piece to have in a military firearms collection, which is, of course, why I own it. The guns on Gun Broker will bring anywhere between 650 bucks to 900 bucks, depending on the condition, what version of the gun it is. Uh, this is a later production gun, as I pointed out earlier. Uh, they do have the Grandpa Nambus, the Baby Nambus, you know, the A's and B's. It also, you have the, uh, the Type 94s, which I don't recommend shooting. If you do get one, you have to be very careful with those. But overall, this is a very cool little gun, a very good looking little gun, albeit a bit strange, kind of a albatross looking thing but it's a very fun gun to shoot and um, I also want to point out that that malfunction that I had had where I said the trigger didn't feel like it was working properly was because the gun wasn't fully in battery. Now notice the gun's starting to get dirty from shooting it today and you'll notice that when I push it back it stays slightly out of battery. I can nudge it home, watch my push it. When it's just that far out of battery it deactivates the trigger. It's a safety mechanism and even with the brand new Wolf Springs they have in the gun it still doesn't have quite enough energy to push itself all the way closed sometimes. I may put the Wolf Extra Power Springs in there, so they do offer a spring upgrade that increases the spring rate. And I may put those in there if I ever decide to shoot the gun again. I have already purchased them. They're just sitting in a drawer. I may stick them in there. And um, yeah, well, if you guys have any questions about anything you've seen in this video, of course, you can ask those questions down below. I try to stick around after the first couple of days when a video goes live to answer the questions you guys may have. And if you would like to support the Military Arms Channel, you can do so by swinging by and checking out Copper Custom. And I would also like to invite you guys to check out Full30.com. That's Full30.com. We've taken all the web's best firearms content creators and brought them under one roof, and that is Full30.com. Thanks again for watching, everybody. We'll talk to you guys soon.